and welcome to the house in Fata Morgana. Tonight we're playing a visual novel because, you know, we've been basically only playing The Sims <laughs> for a week. And I was sitting there like, oh my God, I don't want to, I don't want to play The Sims again today, but I, I've just, I, I cannot bring myself to play like a big action oriented thing right now. And so I finally decided that I was going to play a visual novel. And then it took me a while to decide on a visual novel. And I was like, oh, uh, it's got to be one that I haven't played before. But it's also got to be one that I'm interested in. And so eventually, after about 25 minutes being late for the stream, I decided on the house in Fata Morgana. I've never played this game. And I know nothing about this game. Like, beforehand. This isn't like Umi Neko, uh, which I play, have played with a whole bunch of people, and I know all sorts of stuff about it. I've heard that this is a good visual novel. That's all I've heard. I have no clue about what the contents might be. I have a nice cup of water. This is gonna be a really, just for anybody who happens to pop in, this is gonna be a really good stream for watching the VOD. You know, this isn't, I'm not expecting a lot of people to hop in tonight. This is gonna be kind of a slow burn stream. We're just gonna be playing this visual novel basically. <laughs> so if anybody is like, uh, I wanna watch Ruin's stream, but I don't know, I'm just not feeling it tonight. Just like go take a break, okay? Go take a break and come back. Go out, you know, you can watch the VOD later. Just don't worry about it. Have a good day. Treat yourself. Now, because I like being nice to the people on my stream, and because I myself am a little bit thick skinned when it comes to these things, I do have to say that Fata Morgana has a lot of elements I've heard. I've heard has elements of sexual abuse, emotional and physical abuse, familial abuse. It has gore and descriptions of gore. And there are also parts of it that have transphobic language. Though the game itself, I've heard, does not portray uh, transphobia as positive. That's what I under that is what I've heard. So hopefully I haven't spoiled anybody on the contents of the game, but the good news is that hopefully people know a bit more about what they're getting into before they're like, I'm gonna, you know, Rowan streaming, I'm gonna sit down and I'm gonna I'm gonna watch her play this game. And then I sit down and I play the game and everything sucks and is miserable forever. I don't want that to happen. So, you know, content warnings. If anybody is in the chat who's played this game before and knows stuff about this game and they're like, uh, Rowan, you didn't cover all the content warnings, please tell me. Please, 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 please tell me about content warnings. I am begging you. But anyway. Okay, well, people can't, <laughs> people can't see my mouse, which is unfortunate. Or maybe it's fortunate, I don't know. Sometimes visual novels work really well with having a mouse on the screen and sometimes visual novels are terrible with having the visual, with having the mouse on the screen. And, you know, I've done this a bit before. Uh, visual novels were some of the first games that I streamed. So I just want people to understand that over the course of the stream, I might, you know, pause or take a drink of water or like I might have to like take a quick break or something like this isn't going to be a super consistent viewing experience. 
So don't, you know, don't come in being like, aha, I have all these expectations. No, nah, I'm literally just going to read the text. I might do character voices. I might not. I might uh, speak in my deep gravelly sort of. <clears throat> See, I can't quite get it right. But my, but my, the voice that I used while I was playing, um, what's the game called? World of Horror, that game, where I can't really pronounce the difference between an H and an O, so it just sounds like I'm saying or. <laughs> World of Horror. I might do that voice, I might do different voices. Basically what I'm trying to say is, you know, come in with like medium expectations. Mo first and foremost, this is gonna be a chill stream with some cool sort of like visual novel stuff happening in the background. I have to adjust how I'm sitting. Produced by Novik... Noviktakal. Noviktakal? Novektakal. Like a spectacle. Novektakal. I understood it after a minute. Oh, now my mouse shows up. Hi. Okay. I'm going to leave my mouse in an auspicious spot on the screen down in the corner. There is a house that sits beyond dark, dense woods. Like the wor- That's a little bit loud. Like the world fading into view after a dream. That old mansion appears before you. Without realizing it. You instinctively accept as truth the events unfolding before you. The house lives in perpetuity, an amalgam of myriad fates and generations. No one knows who first said. That the mansion itself was cursed. Planning, script, and direction, Keika Hanada. Art, Moyetaro. Music, Melican. Gao, Yusuke Tsusumi, Takaki Maria, and Aikama Razuna. The house in Fada Morgana. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Have mercy on me, O Father. And cast their souls into eternal damnation. I was looking down upon a corpse, my own corpse, I was afflicted with great despair, 
at the sight of it being dragged to the place of my crucifixion. My soul crumbled, and I was wholly extinguished. Indeed, I did once lose everything. However, as I faded into darkness everlasting, I heard a voice calling out to me. And so, I vowed once more that no matter how long it may take, how great the obstacles that stand in my way, or what form you may assume, I shall return for you, that I must return to that house. So I ask of you, please wait until this mutilated body arrives there once more. Your consciousness, wavering like a ship at sea, was slowly drawn back to the surface. With each new breath, feeling gradually returned to your fingers. I don't know if this game is going to have voice acting, so give me a second. You could hear the pattering of rain from somewhere far away. and the sound of a crackling fire. Creak, creak, creak. When you came to, you were rocking back and forth in a rocking chair. The room was dimly lit. Aside from the flickering of the fireplace, there was no other illumination. Okay, I do have to test something real quick. Test, test, test. One, two, three. Something real quick. Test, test, test. One, two, three. All right, that's pretty good, actually. The audio mixing's not bad. The room was dimly lit. Aside from the flickering of the fireplace, there was no other illumination. No light shone through the closed windows. There was only the pitter-patter of rain on the glass. It was as though the whole mansion had been enveloped in darkness. Oh, splendid. You have finally awoken. Someone called out to you. You were about to search the room, but that turned out to be unnecessary. The source of the voice was crouching beside the chair, looking up at you with emerald eyes. Good morning, Master. Good morning. (laughs) What is the matter? Are you still waking up? You seem rather drowsy. Come now, you must gather yourself, though I am glad to hear your voice. I have simply been waiting so long for this moment. Tending to the mansion all by my lonesome, ensuring that it was ready for your return, whatever that time may be. When I caught sight of you through the window, my heart fluttered. The time has finally arrived. You are perplexed. This woman, who looked like a maid, seemed to know you, but you have no memory of her. What kind of herbal tea would you like to start your day with? I have some wonderful chamomile leaves, if you would like. Or perhaps your tastes have changed since we last met. Tell me, Master, what would you prefer? (laughs) I beg your pardon. I allowed myself to get a bit too excited. But I hope you will be sympathetic, Master. I am just utterly elated that I could see you again. The woman appeared to be genuinely delighted at your awakening but she lacked the energy typical of her young age. Or perhaps life was more appropriate of a word than energy. The gloom extended beyond the maid. It seemed to encompass the entire mansion. The plaster walls illuminated by the fireplace and the rose engravings in the ebony pillars felt vaguely familiar somehow. But a crushing sense of claustrophobia overpowered that familiarity. It was as though the house wasn't interested in accepting you just yet. Oh my, 
You do not know who I am. Do you not know who you are, either? That is quite the predicament. If you cannot remember who you are, then who am I to serve? The woman's face was pale, almost as though she... A faint chill ran down your spine. You are the master of this house, though it would seem you have no memories of such. Quite the dilemma. If you know not who you are, then you are no different than a stranger to me, no? Indeed, you have returned. But from where? That I cannot say. How about this? I am a servant of this mansion, and as such I am familiar with the many incidents that have taken place here. I shall show you the history of this house, master. That will surely allow you to recall who you are. The freshly awakened gears in your head began to turn as you mulled things over. The maid had called you the master of the house, after all. But without a single mirror in the room, you had no way of knowing what you yourself looked like. Unable to decide, you reflexively nodded. Let us be off, then. And fear not. I merely entreat you not to let go of my hand. Should you hold it tightly, you need not worry about being washed away by the waves of history. No matter what happens, you mustn't let go. Your hand in hers, you follow the maid lead throughout the halls. The air within the mansion is oppressive, as though a black miasma was hovering inside of it. The house was bleak and barren, with hardly a trace of color to be found. You came across an open window. Beyond it lay nothing but darkness. Neither sunlight nor moonlight could be seen. There were no chirping birds, no rustling grass, no signs of life at all. Everything that would give color to the world had vanished entirely. The only other presence was that of the maid. Following her lead, you proceeded through the mansion. After some time, you arrived at a double door, the glass within shattered. The door, once pure white, had long since faded into a dull gray. It appeared to lead to the back garden. You could hear children laughing on the other side. Though it is in the state you now see it, a beautiful, beautiful garden once lay beyond these doors. The owner of the time enjoyed gathering rare species of rose from across the world. As it, at its grandest, it seemed every flower was in constant competition for the most majestic bloom. Would you like to see this era of splendor and prosperity? He he he. I very much hope it is to your liking, Master. The maid opened the doors to the back garden. A gust of wind brushed across your face, forcing you to close your eyes as you followed the maid out the doors. When you next opened your eyes, the world was no longer blanketed in shadows. The First Door Sixteen O three. Okay, can't move it there yet, but <laughs> oh, 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 there it is. Save. There we go. The mansion had an alluring air of beauty about it in that era. It was almost like something out of a fairy tale. This period of history could perhaps be described as a symphony of destruction, as the cumbersome principles of old came crashing down. Freed from the day of... This has to be too loud. Test? 
Okay. It is a bit too loud. Hold on. Freed from the day-to-day -day oppression of those antiquated precepts, the people harked back to the more poetic, expressive ways of old. They took newly blossoming emotions in hand, and with them they wrote literature, painted portraits, composed theater, and found love. Even the church, which maintained authority throughout the Middle Ages, embraced the changing times, adopting the culture's flowering sense of aesthetic. War would break out not 20 years from then, plucking the ripened era from the tree of history, but that is of no concern to the people of now. At the time, it is still what people refer to as the Golden Age, a period of furor for all who were there. Now, let us take a slight detour. No, we will not be changing locations. This is a tale about the mansion, from beginning to end. We will, however, be moving through time. Say, about eight years into the past. A very wealthy family lived in the house then. The mother and father, brother and sister, all had distinctive, beautiful flaxen hair. I was always enamored by their hair. By contrast, mine is like the color of a wet crow. See? There I am, standing around, looking rather a fool. I was happy back then. And what reason did I have not to be, afforded the opportunity to attend such a beautiful home? So I poured my heart into serving that family. Listen closely, if you would. That soft, fleeting sound that could only be a young girl singing. Can you hear it? I can't do a young girl voice. I can do this voice. La la la, la 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 la. The girl you see, cheerfully picking crimson roses and singing like a songbird, was called Nellie. Though young, she sang with elegance. Nellie was deeply fond of the house's garden and she would often spend her afternoons there. Gorgeous roses gathered from all across the world bloomed in the garden. They were given the utmost care, and it even had their thorns removed, so young Nellie could not hurt herself. The light brown-haired girl carefully plucked petals from the roses, gathering them up in her dress as she sang. Her voice was like music played by fairies. Nay, the sight of her was like an angel descended from heaven. Oh dear, please don't look at me like that. I admit I was being rather fanciful with my description. But what is a woman if not fanciful? <laughs> Nellie was, as a matter of fact, not the only visitor to the Rose Garden that day. She always came with her older brother, Mel. The young siblings were inseparable in their youth. Mel adored his little sister, who in turn pined for his attention. The sight of the two children cuddling together, not yet shackled by fear for the future, was truly heartwarming. That day, Mel was sitting in the shade of a tree, reading a book. As I am sure you are aware, in their time, books could not yet be mass-produced. What he was reading had been copied personally by a scribe. I presume he had borrowed it from the church itself. The book, having passed through many hands over many years, was visibly worn, but I suppose that just speaks to its importance. It was, in fact, a Latin grammar textbook that he was reading. Mel was a clever boy. He had attended church from a very young age, where a priest would instruct him in Latin grammar. 
so at that time, I believe he was capable of reading even advanced text in the language. Oh, dearest Mel, please. The young girl approached her brother, who was consumed by the text. In her hands, she carried a pile of rose petals. Though his sister's shadow overlapped with the trees, the boy still did not notice. So Nellie puffed her cheeks, thrust out her slender arms, and let the petals fall. Ah! <laughs> Look, your head is covered in roses, Mel. Oh, oh Nellie, you got petals on the book. This isn't mine. I can't afford to let it get dirty. <laughs> it's your fault, dearest Mel. I tried to get your attention. And besides, flowers don't get a book dirty. <laughs> I must raise the right flag. When did my little lady find herself such a sharp wit? While waiting for you, dearest Mel. I waited and waited, and you didn't so much as glance at me. I'll be an adult by the time you're done reading that book. <laughs> wow, that's soon? <laughs> that's soon. Mother says girls grow up fast. <laughs> she may be right. In that case, we should do something together before you're all grown up. Surely you won't play with me any longer when you become an adult. That's not true. I'll still play with you, even when I'm grown up. <laughs> but grown-ups don't play, Nellie. Fine. I'll just have to stay a child forever, then. <laughs> Didn't you just say you were about to grow up? Uh, you're so mean to me, Mel. <laughs> I'm sorry. Please don't pout, my little lady. How about this? To make it up with you, I'll play with whatever you want today. Really? Do you mean it? I want to play make-believe. <laughs> make-believe? Make-believe. I will be a princess, taken captive by an evil kingdom, and you, dearest Mel, will be my valiant knight. And then you turn into a prince with you rescue me. A knight can become a prince. Impressive. They can. Knights and princes both have to be charming, so of course they can. Which is why, which is why it must be you, dearest Mel. No one else can be my prince or my knight. While he may have appeared outwardly embarrassed as his rose-cheeked sister reclaimed prattlingly, I'm certain he was smiling on the inside. After a few minutes, he meekly knelt, bringing himself to eye level with Nellie and gently stroking her soft hair. <laughs> All right then, you're my princess, Nellie. And not just any one princess, dearest Mel, but yours alone. So, um, don't be anyone else's prince but mine, okay? Nellie. My princess is quite the fawner, isn't she? Is that bad? Does that make you dislike me? Not at all. I'm proud to have you as my sister, Nellie. Do you mean more to me than anything in the world, my dear princess? <laughs> I love you, Mel. You'll always be my prince, forever and ever. Her mood quite improved. Nellie began humming the melody of the song she had forgotten the lyrics to. Holding the skirt of the dress out and away from her body, the young girl pranced about the rose garden. Mel, her, his eyes on her back, gave a little shrug. Oh, Nellie, don't come trying to me if you trip running around like that. But Mel was not entirely disapproving of his sister's excitement. He carefully brushed aside the petals that had fluttered onto his book, set it gently in the shade of the tree, and began chasing after Nellie. They were picturesque siblings, brimming with hope. And at this time in their lives, there was nothing to jeopardize that hope. Would it not be wonderful if children could stay children forever, Master? As I see it, though, the pleasant, gentle times in our lives have value because they come to an end. Wouldn't you agree? Time continues to flow, impartial and without exception, and as such, everyone's childhood must come to an end. Be that as it may, does time also flow at the same speed for everybody? <laughs> now let us take a trip down the river of time. I would be very much delighted if we could remain at this spot forever, but unfortunately we cannot. Please, do not let go of my hand, Master. The 
I'll be on my way then. Oh? You usually stay for longer. <laughs> yes, I have an errand to run today. Thank you for your time, as always. Would you like the book back sometime next week? <laughs> next week or the week after. Hold on to it as long as you'd like. <laughs> but surely there are others who want to use it. None as sharp as you, Mel. Put yourself in my shoes and you'd understand. I want to give you any advantage you can get. <laughs> oh, do you not believe me? <laughs> no, I believe you, Father. And I mean to do whatever I can not to disappoint you. That's the spirit, my boy. If you need anything, don't hesitate to ask. I'm proud to have you as my pupil. Ah, yes, and Mel, do consider what we were talking about. <laughs> Going to university? Indeed. If you do, I can introduce you to some accomplished instructors. There is very little left for me to teach you, and I believe you would make a fine priest. I... It's an honorable thing, Mel, to devote yourself to the service of the Lord. Mm. I'll give it some thought. If you'll excuse me, then, I'll see you again sometime. Our doors are always open. Farewell. <sighs> Whether it's in the service of God or the service of the church, it is an honorable profession. But theology... I wouldn't mind attending university, but I'm just not sure. I'd kind of like to do something different. Something more befitting of our times. For what, though? I'm stumped. But I need to make up my mind sooner or later. If I drag my feet for too long, even father's liable to grow impatient. Mercy me. Young sire, blessed young sire, alms, alms for the poor. Uh, this beggar, if I'm not mistaken, he's been outside the church since last week. Alms. The way he shakes his head, I can get a glimpse of his forehead under his hood. He's completely bald. Buy yourself some bread with this. Ah, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. May the Lord bless your soul. <laughs> Thanks. The Lord, huh? Mm. Oh no. Nellie's gonna be cross if I don't get home. Curses. And it looks like it's going to rain, too. Master. Master? Oh, thank goodness. You appear to have a firm grasp on your consciousness here. I was afraid you would let go of my hand. <laughs> now, Master, this is the period of time I truly wish to show you. The boy reading in the Rose Garden is now a fine young man. Nonetheless, he still bears his same gentle eyes as before, and he would from time to time show remnants of that innocent young boy. He was, in his own mind, still making the transition into adulthood, I suspect. Mel frequently visited the church, on Sundays to participate in Mass, of course, but more often to be tutored personally by the priest. In addition, he attended a private school run by an eminent marquee, though it was not a school where students had desks and sat in rows. They studied at the marquee's estate. Secondary and higher education was not the same as it is today, you see and Mel was considering university. The priest wanted to recruit him to the church, but Mel was having difficulty deciding what he should do. That he had such a choice to himself is envious, is it not? Good afternoon. I'm here to pick up my older, my older, my order. Is it ready? Aye, ready and waiting, young master Rhodes. Uh, don't call me young master, please. I beg your pardon. Can I seem to get it out of my... I cannot talk in this accent for very long, but I'll try. Can I seem to get my head out of the past? Your order is right here, sir. Mel had stopped in a jewelry store at the center of town on his way back from the church. The building was both a workshop and a storefront, and the nobles of the area were deeply fond of the master's wares. He was skilled enough that even the royal family had commissioned work from him. As a matter of fact, the wooden sign out front was engraved with a replica of a piece of his jewelry, said to be dis on display in the palace. 
As artistry flourished in the Golden Age, the number of shops selling luxurious items and jewelry rose in kind. But the clientele of these shops comprised a very narrow range of people. Uh, may I have a look? Of course, of course. Mm. Good. It came out just as I'd hoped. Splendid work. <laughs> Can I afford to disappoint a loyal customer like yourself? An admirable work ethic as well. I'm sure she'll love it. Such a kind lad, young master. My boy back home could do well to learn a thing or two from you. Every man ought to show women some cordiality. Coming home to a cold fireplace is a sad thing indeed, you know. Ha ha ha. Again, please don't call me young master. <laughs> my apologies. I'll take this and be on my way then. Good day. And find yourself in need of aught else, just let me know. I can make any jewelry you ask for. Come to me and your sweetheart's day will be sure as made. And I guarantee the two of you will have all sorts of fun when you give it to her. P -p please I don't have a sweetheart. Huh. Well, that's a surprise. I'm sure many girls are vying for your hand too, you Mr. Rhodes. A fine family, good looks, charming, and your future's all but I I'll be on my way then. I'm in a bit of a hurry, thank you. Good day, come by again any time. Goodness. <sighs> Maybe I'll say I want to study abroad or something. Patient as my father may be, that would certainly anchor him. I can hear it now. You're wasting your God-given talents, boy. I could renounce my name and rank. Go somewhere far away. <laughs> Sounds like the sort of plan Nelly would come up with. As he drew closer to the mansion, the rich fragrance of roses grew more prominent in turn. Over time, the distinctive scent led visitors to refer to the house as the Rose Manor. It was also probably a play on the flaxen-haired family's nest name, Rhodes, which you heard the owner of the jewelry store just say moments later. Earlier. Earlier, not later. Earlier, definitely. The mansion looked quite different than it does now, no? No thickets of ivy covering the walls. No rotting broken doors to be found. I wonder what the Rhodes family would think if they saw the house in its present condition. The sight of their abundantly blooming roses, a veritable symbol of prosperity, long since withered and turned into the soil. <laughs> My apologies. I got a little sentimental there. Let us forget for a moment about our own time. I suppose I stayed out a little bit too long. Oh well, the sun still shines high in the sky. I'm sure it's... <clears throat> dearest, dearest Mel, what took you so long? Wherever have you been? I've been waiting forever. N N Nelly, you're not in the house. Nope, you were taking so long I decided to wait by the gate. But you didn't even notice me at all. Is there any way to treat a lady? All that studying's got your head stuck up in the clouds. No, it hasn't, really. Also, uh, you're heavy. Could you please get off of my back? Heavy? I've been gradually reducing the amount of sweets I eat. And I love sweets, you know, to maintain for my figure from a new dress. And you call me heavy. Uh... Uh, I, I didn't catch that. Were you saying a tongue twister? You're such a dimwit, Mel. Jerk, blockhead, weakling, and obnoxious to boot. Whatever happened to the delightful little girl who was once my younger sister? She'd probably throw a fit if I said that out loud, though. Should you really be outside, Nelly? You are the star of today's event. Oh, it's fine. They can call it a birthday party, but I know it's just about fraternizing. It's obvious what father's true motives are. He'll be gathering a bunch of boys from good families to look for someone to marry me off to. Ugh, I have no interest in that at all. Don't be like that, Nelly. They're all here for you. At least enjoy what you can at the party. Uh, I guess. Besides, it's not completely terrible. Look at this, dearest Mel. What do you think? What do I think? About what? 
About what? Me. Oh, <laughs> that's not what she said. Mel, my new dress. It's here. I'm wearing it. How could you not notice? I, I, I did notice. It was something I hadn't seen before. But you have so many dresses, Nelly. I... But this is the dress I had made just for today. Look at the colors. They're so pretty. It's the work of a renowned dyer. And this belt is just perfect. Do you see how it comes together to form a butterfly? Uh, oh. Oh, I'm just absolutely in love with it. I think I'll be wearing this dress for a while to come. So tell me, what do you think? Does it look good on me? Uh, yeah, it does. It's pretty. <laughs> In some ways, I guess she is still a delightful little girl at heart. Oh, dearest Mel, I love you. Uh, whoa, don't jump on me like that. Uh, oh my, you dropped something. And what have we here? W wait, no, you can't have that yet. Is it a present? G give it back. I was going to give that to you later. I knew it. It's for me. Just what could it be? Hey, don't open it. What's the big deal? It's going to be mine soon anyway, isn't it? Oh, I love it. A rose necklace. And this design. It's from that jeweler the royal family uses. Oh, my dearest Mel. You had this made just for me, didn't you? Oh, jeez. It defeats the purpose if you open it before the party, Nelly. Happiness is sooner than... Blah, 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 blah. I can't talk. Happiness is always better sooner rather than later, Mel. I think I'll put it on right away. There. How does it look? It looks lovely. Mm -hmm. My prince is still the sweetest in all the land. D don't make weird noises. Oh, but why not? A prince always knows exactly what his princess wants. And this princess wanted some jewelry to go with her new dress. Understand? <laughs> Jeez, I sure don't have it easy playing your prince, Nelly. Might be about time you found a new one for yourself. A prince is a prince because you can't just find one standing on the street corner. If you want to retire, dearest Mel, you're going to have to wait another ten years at least. <laughs> That's a long time. Or if you find yourself a new princess. I, I, I'm I, not so... Uh. <laughs> You're about as romantic as a rock, dearest Mel. But worry not, your adorable sister will always be your princess for you. What more could you want? Are you really allowed to be the judge of that? I mean more to you than any other girl in the world, do I not? Then that makes me your princess. <laughs> uh. Hey, what's with that laugh and it'll all be over soon laugh? You're always telling me I mean more than anyone to you. Y yeah, you do. More than anyone in the world, my beloved baby sister. <laughs> I'll take good care of this necklace. Thank you, my dearest Mel. Well, if you're happy with it, then so am I. You're very welcome. Now, back into the house with you. Can't have a party without the guest of honor. Do you know if anyone else is here yet? Mm, nope. I imagine they'll be here soon, though. W were you down at the church again, Mel? Uh, yeah. There was something I didn't know how to translate, so I went to the priest to look it up. Wow, so diligent. Can't say I really like the priest there, personally. Actually, I kind of feel the same way. What? Really? Why? Well, you know, I have my reasons. Hmm... So even you don't always like the priest, huh? Let's skip mass on Sunday, then. We can go play. No skipping church. As grew the brother, so did do the sister. That day, Nellie would be turning 14, and Mel, three years her senior, was 17. You saw with your own eyes, so you know just how much she has changed. She was always a cute little girl, and she grew into an even more beautiful young woman. Though she was only 14, she was well on her way to becoming a fine lady. As for her character, well... <laughs> but a girl like that has her own charms, wouldn't you say? 
Drifting down the river of time, the two siblings matured into healthy young adults, but the core of their relationship did not change in the slightest. Nellie was very much attached to her brother, and as much as Mel complained, he still cared deeply for her. Around the time the sun had begun to set, carriages started lining up outside, and well-dressed aristocrats made their way into the house. As Nellie had suspected, the majority of them were boys. Yes, I understand. You don't need to say anything more. Rose Manor, right? Okay, we'll go together. Me? Alone? <laughs> no, please don't make me. The inhabitants of Rose Manor are surely living quite contented lives, and I'm sure they don't remember a thing. The room with the fireplace was always kept in pristine condition to entertain guests at any time. Walls colorfully decorated with tapestries and stained glass windows gave testament to the family's great fortune. The servant's first assignment every morning was to clean this room. Pitchers, silver plates, and silverware were polished to a shine so they could be proudly put to use at a moment's notice. And for events like their daughter's birthday, the room served an even more important role. The table's tops were removable, so they had ordered new tabletops with designs made specifically, specifically, with designs made especially for this occasion. And once the banquet had drawn to a close, the tables speckled with half-empty wine glasses and leftover candied fruits were moved off to the side to make room for, of course, the festivities. Good evening, Lady Nelly. You're looking particularly lovely today. Nelly, I had these jewels cut just for you. <laughs> You'll let me have this dance, won't you? <sighs> What's the matter, Nelly? You look exhausted. These are pretty. These are pretty good. Want one? I know you like sweets. They're apples candied in sugar, I think. You disappoint me, dearest Mel. Huh? What do you think is the matter? They just keep coming. It never ends. It's driving me up the wall. Everyone's just repeating the same lines that they've been taught since the day they were born. They all think pretty jewels and request to dance are enough to make a girl swoon for them. But I think that is true for you, Nelly. Though, why is she disappointed with me? Ah, I think I'm done with birthday parties after this year. They'll probably throw an even bigger one next year, you know. Huh? Why? Well, you know, you're about that age, Nellie. We are a reasonably distinguished family, so there are a number of different houses that would like to have connections with us. So? Hmm... So what you're saying is, do it for the family. No, that's not. I won't date or marry anyone. I have no interest in being used as a pawn in inter-family politics. Pawn? I wouldn't go that far. A and I'm sure Father wants you to let you choose yourself. You know, uh, someone you actually love. Love? I, I never thought I would hear you talking about love, dearest Mel. Uh... You don't even understand what makes Shakespeare's plays beautiful, and you're talking about love. I, uh... You fell asleep during Romeo and Juliet, and you're talking about love to me. We went all the way out to the Globe Theater itself. Well, pardon me for being ignorant when it comes to romance and the arts. But you're not, Nellie. Shakespeare's make-believe story make you cry like a baby. Anyone would cry at that. You'd have to be crazy to s crazy. You'd have to be crazy. You'd have to be crazy to sleep through it. That's not what I'm saying. Someone as emotionally vibrant as you, Nellie, would have no problem falling in love. 
Oh, dearest Mel, we should dance. Lady Nelly, could I have this? Let's dance, dearest Mel. What? What? Me? Wait a minute. Come on, I really like this song. Qu quit pulling on me, Nelly. What's the point of us dancing? We're siblings. Ah, uh, mother and father are staring daggers at us. No matter. What day is it today, dearest Mel? Your birthday. Exactly. So I get to do whatever I want. Now attend to your princess, as a proper prince should. Oh, jeez. How did I get myself into this? Nellie's skirt fluttered along with her as she stepped in time to the music. She was not only a skilled singer, but a skilled dancer as well. Mel, on the other hand, was fumbling over his own feet, trying to keep up. One would be hard-pressed to describe his dance abilities as good, even if it was flattery. Though boys of his pedigree were taught to dance as part of their etiquette lessons, he found himself more being dragged around by his sister on the floor. He could hardly be said to be attending to her. Th this is humiliating. Because his parents had been hands-off in raising him, giving him free reign to study and learn what he pleased, Mel looked like a tangled-up marionette in the dance. From throughout the hall, he could hear giggling, uncomfortable chuckling, and people coughing to disguise their rude laughter. Oh, come on now, dearest Mel. If this is the best you can manage, what are you going to do when you find a girl that catches your eye? I won't, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> Follow my lead, Mel. One, two, three. One, two, three. <laughs> Nelly alone enjoyed her time dancing with her brother, and quite thoroughly at that. It did not matter to her that he moved awkwardly or that the guests were giving them cold stares. It was their parents who first cracked under the pressure. Just as their father was about to give an exaggerated cough and stop the music entirely, a ruckus swelled up near the entrance. What could that be? Who knows? Whatever's going on, I've been spared this humiliation. The music came to a stop and the party guests started to bustle. The sibling's father spoke up sternly above the noise in order to quell the spreading commotion. He ordered the servants to investigate, had the music restarted, gave a short apology, and set the party back on course. I went to go check on the entrance with the other servants, as I recall. Oh my, why are you looking at me like that? <laughs> These are not my memories, but those which dwell within the mansion. Do you think we should be following what happens next from my perspective, then? That is not what confused you. Now well, your questions shall be answered in time. In time. Now let us return to our tale. Though the party had fallen still for a moment, their father's decisive actions restored the guests' festive moods in short order. So it was not by any means the commotion that caused the ball to conclude earlier than planned. Oh dear, I hear thunder. It was rather loud, too. Sounds like we have quite the storm brewing. They lived in a country where weather was nothing if not unpredictable. Rain was a frequent occurrence there. The stretches of time with clear skies, clear skies, and clear vocabulary grew longer as summer approached, but the weather was still somewhat unstable on the cusp of the two seasons. They had a strong wind that night as well, which turned the raindrops into little spears against the windows, were the party to continue on any longer, no one would be able to leave after it was done. Although their father was quite concerned that Nellie had not got on with any of the aristocrat boys, he decided to cut the festivities short regardless. Thank goodness it ended early. How lucky I am. This must be a blessing for always being such a good girl. I'm not sure having your own birthday party cut short counts as lucky. Uh, but it was no fun! I can't help it if I'm not enjoying myself. And for heaven's sake, Arthur was here. I have no interest in dancing with that dunce. Uh, Arthur? Who's that again? Someone who was here? Unbelievable! You don't remember anything, do you, dearest Mel? He came over to play a few times when we were little and everything. He's covered in gross freckles, and he's a huge jerk. He said my hair looked like the color of fallen leaves. 
fallen leaves. Just thinking about that ugly smirk has me fuming. And yet he acts like nothing ever happened. He even calls me Lady Nelly, for goodness sake. Are you listening, dearest Mel? Uh, I I'm listening, I'm listening. I wonder what the ruckus earlier was. Ah, oh, you weren't listening at all, are you? Who cares about that? S sorry but aren't you curious? It probably wasn't another guest at the very least. Maybe a cat sneaked in or something, I don't know. You think so? I do. But enough about that. Would you like to play cards in my room with me, dearest Mel? Seriously? I'm exhausted though. It's not even that late. Uh, fine. Something feels kind of off. A cat? I want to go check. Come on, hurry up. Uh, oh, hold on. You don't need to drag me, Nelly. My birthday isn't over yet, so you're not done attending to me. Oh, Nelly. I have a horrible suspicion about where this is going. <laughs> we might have to tack a few more uh, content warnings onto this one. The rain just won't let up, huh? I can't sleep. I wonder what the commotion earlier was about. Oh, for goodness sake. It's all the storm's fault, isn't it? That's why I can't sleep. I'm just fretting over nothing, aren't I? I'm sure Nelly was right. It was just a cat. Maybe a dog? Uh. I can't sleep. I hardly ever have this much trouble falling asleep. What could this feeling be? It's not quite foreboding. Walking around the house at this time of night isn't gonna help anything. But I'm not going to fall asleep just lying here. The only sounds that could be heard in the dark corridors were the sharp pitter-patter of the rain on the windows, his footsteps, and his breath in his ear. Though he was intimately familiar with the layout of his home, that night the hallways felt like an endless labyrinth veiled in shadows. No moonlight shone through the windows, so he naturally found himself moving cautiously, despite being in his own home. Keeping the palm of his hand pressed up against the cold wall, he put one foot in front of the other and kept moving. But where was he supposed to go? Mel, of course, had no way of answering that question by himself. If he had anything, it was guidance from above, the path to his destination lit by flashes of lightning or perhaps there was something else leading him along. Though he progressed with a fair bit of hesitation in his step, Mel was slowly but surely, surely drawing nearer to one room in particular. He made his way through the seemingly endless halls, past the living room, its fireplace long since put out, into another corridor, and then stepped outside in Abigail's bedchamber. The dim glow of a lamp spilled through the cracks in the door. A gust of wind isn't necessary to make a flame flicker. A person's movements or vibrations in the air from someone speaking, the slightest of motions can cause the light of the fire to move, shifting subtly as though nudged by an invisible fingertip. I can see light from inside. Is she still awake? There's a voice. He was hesitating. It would not be difficult for him to approach the door and simply peer inside, but he had reservations about peeping in on another's chambers, even if it was in his own house. Moreover, this room was assigned to a woman. There was a woman behind that door. 
What would you do, Master, in this situation? Would you succumb to your curiosity and gaze inside? Or would you respect the owner's delicate privacy? <laughs> I shouldn't be doing this, but that voice, it feels like it's calling to me or someone else. I, yes, me, could sense someone watching me at that moment. He had succumbed to his curiosity after all. He stood on the other side of the door from myself, his flaxen eyes open wide, trying to remain as invisible as possible. The wavering in his heart created faint ripples in the air, which I pretended not to notice. Yes, I knew he was there from the very beginning. I could sense his presence and his wavering emotions on the other side of the door. But I could not begin to speculate as to his true feelings or how great a surprise this could be to him. I, too, am discovering new facets of this tale by viewing it through the eyes of the mansion. But it is not I who is of concern, Master. It is you. You and... I know I shouldn't be doing this. I should be ashamed of myself. But I can't... I can't look away. Who is that? Her skin, it's so pale you can practically see through it. Is it that white because she was out in the cold rain? Her hair is white as snow and her eyes, they're like... Like... How do I describe it? My vocabulary always feels lacking for situations like these. They look like... Like blood. No, that's just disturbing. Then wine, perhaps. No, they're more translucent than that. Gemstones, then? Yes. G gemstones. Her eyes are like rubies. I've never seen anyone like her before. What could they be talking about? Mel's eyes were fixed on the peculiar young woman. She had glass-like skin, eyes that glimmered in the flickering candlelight, and snow-white hair that flowed down her back like luxurious silk. But her lips were blue-purple, her soft, delicate skin sullied with grime, her twinkling eyes pointed towards the floor, and her hair a disheveled mess. She was, even at a glance, clearly not a lady of means. The tips of her fingers were cracked from the cold, her nails pale from malnutrition, and her garb little more than rags on her shoulders. However, true beauty is always visible, no matter what it may be hidden beneath, even wrapped in a veil of insalubrity, even, though, even if she thought herself hideous. I wonder what happened to her. Mel could no longer avert his gaze from the girl's visage. He had, for the time being, forgotten the shame he felt for peeping. As he strained his ears to hear the conversation taking place inside, a sickly voice arose from the white-haired girl's darkened lips. So feeble was the sound that a gentle breeze blowing through the room could carry it away and lose it forever. I apologize for the trouble. Think nothing of it. Give your apologies and thanks to the mistress. Understood. Hmm. There is something strangely comforting about this house. It's like I've been here before. If my father were here, I'm sure he would be quite fond of it. I am sorry about your father. That's not... There's nothing you could have done, I imagine. When you came to our rescue, he was already... Mm. Rescue? Father? Was that perchance what the commotion was about? He stared intently, entranced by the scene unfolding beyond the door. A gaze can often signal one's presence to others more effectively than words. The white-haired girl probably saw him there as well. 
She flicked her gem-like eyes upward. Uh. That was when the boy finally felt a pang of panic. For a split second, his flaxen eyes met her rubies, causing him to recoil from the door in fear and shame. His heart was pounding like the rain outside the window. Careful not to make even a single sound, he took one, then two steps away. Did... did she catch me? Uh, I'm not sure. It, it was only for a moment. She can't have seen me. The boy did not have the courage to begin on the room a second time, so he cautiously returned to his bedchamber as quietly as he could manage. But even beneath his covers, he could not erase the girl's eyes from his memory. Her melancholic irises, her voice delicate like a glass sculpture, her pale, almost lifeless skin, and her pure white hair. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. Every singular detail kept him from banishing her image from his mind, nor could he restrain his pounding heart. Who could she be? Is something the matter? No, I just thought I felt someone watching us. <laughs> it's only your imagination, I'm sure. If not your imagination, then perhaps some unseen force was looking at you. Unseen force? Are you familiar with how people refer to this mansion? Rose Manor, of course. Yes, indeed. It is called Rose Manor because you can smell the sweet fragrance of the Rose Garden, even from a great distance. But that's not what I meant. It is said that a witch resides deep within the house. A witch? I have not heard any such stories. You probably wouldn't have. It was a very, very long time ago. Nothing you need concern yourself with. You have a peculiar presence about you. <laughs> Should I consider that a compliment? <laughs> It's getting late. You should get some rest. A room has already been set aside for you. But first, may I ask you one thing? Yes. I do not believe you have given me your name just yet. My name... My name is... Uh, wake up. Get up, Mel. Uh, <coughs> it, it's morning? Uh, you disappoint me, dearest Mel. It's very much past morning. I didn't see you at breakfast, so I came here to find out what was the matter. I've really been asleep that long? And father's too lenient on you, dearest Mel. Oversleeping is hardly proper behavior for his firstborn son. I, I, I know, but before that... Yes, dearest Mel? What are you doing in here? You can't just go prancing into a boy's bedchamber. Leave that to the servants. I did send one for you. You're the one who refused to wake up, even at her behest. Besides, it's not like we're strangers. We used to sleep together all the time. That was a long time ago. Things are different now. Oh, you're overthinking it, silly. Now hurry up. Out of bed, sleepyhead. All right, all right, I'm getting up. So you can see yourself out. Oh my, you look awful, dearest Mel. For someone who overslept, you look like you didn't get a wink of sleep. Y y you think so? You didn't go out on the town last night, did you? Naughty, naughty boy. I, 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 I would never do that. You know that. You squeaked. I don't think I believe you. 
I, I didn't go out last night or anything. I'm tired because you had me playing cards until that late, Nelly. Hey, we weren't playing for that long. Besides, look at me. I got up just fine. Uh, anyways, shoo, shoo. I can't get dressed with you in here. Uh, fine, I'm leaving. <sighs> oh, I almost forgot, Davis Mill. What now? Come on, no need to be mean. I'm sure you'd be quite surprised at the news. What? At breakfast, which you missed, by the way. Father told us. Told you what? Do I really want to say? It sounds like you want me out of your room, dearest Mel. Oh, please, Nelly. <laughs> we got a new maid today, from a house we have ties to, supposedly. I've never seen anyone like her before. For supposedly coming from a good family, she's not very graceful, and I've never seen her at a single gathering. But that's not the surprising part. Does the maid... She's peculiar. Has a very unusual appearance, that one. Have white hair? What? How do you know that, dearest Mel? Uh, uh, thanks, Nelly. Hey, get back here. Oh, for goodness sakes, what's gotten into you? Bah. At the time, the majority of the servants at the mansion were men. But the ladies of the house all had Abigails, so there were several women servants, myself included. The maids, by and large, were selected from the daughters of other esteemed families. It was, you could say, a sort of training before they entered society. The girls would serve at houses even more powerful than their own, and the white-haired girl Mel saw the night before was one such maid. When he heard this, Mel could not sit still any longer. Oh, oh, uh, I didn't really think this through, did I? I don't even know where she is. I'm guessing she's probably mother's maid, isn't she? White hair. It has to be the girl from last night. But deep down, he was having difficulty believing the young woman he saw was truly here to be a servant. Can you blame him? When he saw her, she was an absolute mess, hardly what you would envision from a girl of her class, but he did not seek to find out whether that was true. He merely wanted to see her once more, to ascertain whether what he had witnessed was real or his imagination, and he wanted to have an actual conversation with her, at the very least. I don't want to run into mother, that would just be awkward. He was heading towards his mother's bedchamber, but the closer he drew, the heavier each step became. He rounded a corner, debating whether or not to head back, and stopped in his tracks. On occasion, wishes do come true. When Mel turned the corner, he saw her, the same girl with that same white hair. Oh, she's pretty. Uh, she appeared to be cleaning the hallway by herself. She traced along the wooden carvings lining the walls, making certain not to miss even a speck of dust. The gor- the gorl- the gorl werl. The girl wore a pristine dress. The girl wore a pristine dress, the uniform of the mansion's Abigails. There was no longer any filth to obscure her beauty. All that had covered her pure white hair and glass-like skin was no more. The only thing that had not changed was her listless, ruby eyes. P pardon me. Hearing his footsteps, the young woman raised her head. She caught Mel's gaze and for a brief moment merely blinked at him in silence. Lord Mel, yes. Your father informed me of you. D did he? I, I guess I don't need to introduce myself then. I believe she made an attempt to smile, though it was difficult to tell, and she quickly dropped her gaze back to the floor. Flax and Ruby met again, only for the briefest moment. She seemed to be looking at both someone in front of her and no one at all. Everyone here truly has the most beautiful color of hair. Do you have business with the mistress, Lord Mel? I can let her know if you would like. N no, I was looking for you. For me. Mel felt as though all the blood in his body was starting to flow backwards. 
He could not effectively describe the sensation, but it resembled panic. On his way to find her, Mel had come up with a bunch of subjects he wanted to talk about, and he generally had little trouble speaking with others. He had had less experience interacting with women, this was true, but the time he had spent around Nelly had kept him from stumbling too much. Until then. Y yes f for you. Why would you be looking for me, Lord Mel? Uh, I I was wondering how you were doing. Pardon? Uh, I'm quite fine. G good. That's that's great to hear. You fool, Mel. What are you even saying? You have more important things to ask, like where she came from or to tell her sh that she has pretty hair. But I don't want to trouble her too much. L Lord Mel. Yes. S sorry, you just suddenly fell silent. Was I, um, in your way? In my way? No, not at all. Wh what are you up to? I'm cleaning. Well, yeah, I didn't even need to ask, did I? Ah, you're cleaning. Oh, uh, you can just let the other servants take care of the cleaning, you know. You're one of the noble's daughters we took in, right? Why is mother making you... No, I... I'm doing this because I want to. The mistress appeared to be busy, and I could not simply be idle. But I enjoy cleaning. Well, if you say so. Say, uh, um, yesterday. This mansion truly is a thing of beauty. All the many roses in the garden, even the furnishing has had a great deal of thought put into it. This family must have a wonderful sense of aesthetic. Oh, y yeah, thanks. Did she just change the subject for me? I'm delighted to have been given the opportunity to serve at such a magnificent home. Mother and father actually had nothing to do with that. Not even the garden. That's all been around since my grandfather was here. This mansion was a complete wreck when he bought it. Oh, was it? Yeah, frankly, I'm surprised he actually paid money to buy it. The chandelier in the foyer was shattered and only half attached to the ceiling. Most of the decorations on the walls were completely broken. I can hardly imagine that. This is a marvelous, impressive house. <laughs> I'm sure he'd be flattered to hear it. My grandfather was a bit of an eccentric, you know. He liked to do things people didn't expect, just to watch the surprise on their faces. He was the kind of man who would buy a mansion that was beyond repair, just to give it new life. Everyone who had seen the property before it was renovated was astonished. They regretted not taking the opportunity themselves, seeing the transformation it underwent. <laughs> huh? I, I was just thinking that you're kind of like this house. What? What do you mean by that? I mean, when you first arrived. Oh, uh, no, never mind. Forget it. She'll figure out you were peeping on her, stupid. She hasn't figured it out yet, has she? Yes. Uh, it's nothing. The more I think about it, you and the mansion aren't really comparable. Oh? The, the truth is, it being a rundown mess isn't the only reason nobody wanted to buy the house. They say... That all who dwell within the house should be met with misfortune. Do you believe that? I... <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's not actually true. It's all rumors and hearsay, embellished to make the tale more exciting, you know? The rumors only started because of how it used to look before my grandfather bought it. If the mansion truly begot misfortune, we wouldn't still be here. And it wouldn't explain how my grandfather died, either. Do you know how he passed away? 
no, how did he? Inside a lovely lady. What? Believe it or not, that was how he died, together with a young, beautiful woman. His time ran out while he was making love to her, they say. A rather crude way to go. I would hardly call that misfortunate. What did I tell you? Uh, yes? J -j Just so you know, I promise I didn't inherit my grandfather's propensity for such base behavior. I am pure of body and spirit, dedicated wholly to my studies, so... <laughs> hey, I got her to laugh. <laughs> my, my apologies. No, no, it's fine. Anyway, we were talking about the mansion, right? I've always thought it was kind of a weird place myself. That dress you're wearing, it was found here after my grandfather bought the place. You don't see that kind of design around the parts, so it was probably imported. The architecture is really old-fashioned too, which must have caught grandfather's eye. When he announced his plans to buy it, the entire family opposed his decision, but he refused to budge. Renovation upon renovation gave the mansion new life, but all of his work he was most fond of... That didn't make any sense. But of all his work, there we go, he was most fond of the roses in the garden. He collected species from all across the world, and every time he got a new one, he would summon gardeners to arrange and grow them correctly. It took incredibly long to complete. There were even some that wouldn't grow in this climate, but Grandfather refused to give in. He truly loves roses. Me, I don't actually get how someone could be so impassioned about them. It's embarrassing every time this someone calls his house Rose Manor, you know. Perhaps the roses were meant for someone. What? I am simply speculating. Roses make wonderful gifts, after all. Indeed they do. If you like roses as much as Nelly, then you're welcome to go see them for yourself, you know. Pick as many as you'd like. If anyone asks, just say I gave you permission myself. I... Don't be shy. I'm sure it'll get tiring if all you do is work around here. No, I, I just... I'm... Um... Sensitive. To sunlight. Oh, that's unusual. Perhaps that explains why you're so pale. I had no idea. That sounds rough. She has albinism, doesn't she? And your skin is so pretty, too. You don't seem terribly surprised. What? Uh, no, no, I am very much surprised. Or, or would you have preferred a more dramatic response? No, I just... I expected you to find it disturbing. I'm sensitive to sunlight and can hardly spend any time outside. That makes me sound like some kind of demonic creature. <laughs> huh? Oh, you worry too much. There's not a monster in the world as sweet as you are. Uh. Y yes? Are the other maids teasing you, perhaps? That black-haired one especially. She's, how should I put it, a little frightening. Almost like she has a steel heart or something. She's impenetrable. Oh, right. She's one of Mother's maids, too, isn't she? Now I'm even more worried. Since you refuse to follow my instructions, you are henceforth Hellspawn. I can imagine her saying that. <laughs> oh, and again. Uh, I'm very sorry. No need to apologize. In fact, I'd wish you'd laughed more. Um, she's actually very kind to me, and everything she does, she does with incredible precision and efficiency. She looks so young, and yet she has such skill. How long has she been here, in this mansion? Actually, uh, she's been here for quite some time, but I don't know exactly how long. No one knows how old she is. It's kind of starting to get creepy. I, I have never once considered her such. S sorry you're right it's bad to speak ill of others either way she still scares the heck out of me it's like there's no light in the back of her eyes like her smiles are all fake that doesn't make her any less pretty though mm. 
Uh, the conversation died. I have to think of something else to talk about fast. Um. Um. Uh. Oh. Uh. Y yes. You can ask me anything. Does the master, your father, Lord Mal, often retire from the mansion? I have not seen him around. Oh, yeah, father frequently returns home. His mansion is actually our second house. Why do you ask? I was just curious. Nothing more. Uh, oh. Um. Um. Yes, what is it? One of the maids asked to see me, so I need to be on my way. If you'll excuse me. What? Uh, all right. See you later, then. Goodbye. Oh, wait, one moment. Huh? Since you're sensitive to the sun, I can pick some roses from time to time. For you. F f for you to decorate your room. Lord Mel. Th that's all. Sorry for holding you up. Oh, why am I so bad at this all of a sudden? She definitely thinks I'm obnoxious. Oh, I want to go hide under a rock. I want to reverse time and just try this over again. Roses are not very becoming of me. He is too kind. All right, I think that's where I'm going to leave it off for tonight. It seems like a good stopping place, and it's already been an hour and a half, and my voice is getting tired. All of these things are important. There we go. Tranquil days, that's what it's called. All right. Oh, how do I get to... Maybe if I just go to config and do this. Boop. There we go. All right. Well, thank you for joining me for Broken Cowbell tonight. We had a very quiet stream, but that's okay. I was feeling a bit quiet. To those of you turning into the VOD, thank you for that as well. I appreciate everyone who comes in on the stream, even if I don't see you come in at the time. So thanks to everyone who was here. I'll see you all tomorrow, and I hope you have a good week. Goodbye.